Hey, quick heads up. The audio quality isn't as good as we'd like it to be in this episode. Sorry in advance. Welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. This is Bill Kennedy and our special guest today, all the way from Berlin, is Rona Steinberg. Hey, Rona. Hi, Bill. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us over the next hour. I really appreciate it. I know how hot it is in Berlin right now, so... <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna talk over the next hour. Uh, I really am interested in kind of hearing your story and um, your journey, kind of through tech and work and all of that. But before we can start that conversation, give everybody a couple of minutes about what you're doing today. I uh, am a senior software engineer at Delivery Hero, and what I do. At the moment, the big problem in my life is ensuring that alongside your food, you will also receive your receipts in a timely manner, which is a very uh, interesting problem when you look at the uh, legalities for the different countries, different markets, different requirements, you know, the kind of load that we're handling. So it's, uh, it's quite an interesting uh, journey for me. I also organize Women Who Go Berlin and I'm a Google Developer Expert for Go, which essentially means that I teach Go to anyone who wants to hear about it. And I also you know, mentor a little bit in my spare time. I actually also mentor at work now officially, which is kind of nice, but I also mentor on the side. So people who are looking for mentors are always welcome to uh, contact me or also if I am not able to help, I will find somebody else to do that. Just just to stay here for one second. Yeah. I would never have guessed that delivering a receipt would be that complicated of a problem. You made it sound like this was an incredibly difficult problem to solve. Like, just <laughs> give me a couple of minutes. I want to understand after food is delivered, what is the the problem with that receipt? Is it that it has to be done in certain ways for certain countries or is it the delivery itself? So it's on the delivery itself. There, there are certain countries in which uh, we're required, for instance, to report every receipt to the tax authorities, which means that there's going to be an integration with uh, some sort of either the tax authority directly or a third party. And then there is the matter of the uh, receipt itself. Some countries will have a VAT per type of product. Uh, so th there's a lot of, you know, of details that have to do with how anything is filled and paid for. And then um, there is also the matter of timing. So for instance, if you're ordering something to be delivered tomorrow, but paying right now, you should uh, receive your some sort of statement. Or if you're going to be paying later, you might receive an invoice also depending on where you are. So these kinds of legal documents are quite have quite the story behind them of how you know, they differ from one place to another. Uh, somebody has to build uh, these kinds of systems and make sure that they are maintainable and you can add to them and you can add markets to them. So that's what I do. So you're telling me that if I live in one of these countries, you have to report to the government that I ordered a hamburger for X amount of dollars? Some places, yes. And then what, when I file my taxes, I got to show that I ate a hamburger that day on June 10th or something? My mind is being like, you and I are going to have to have larger conversations it's, about uh, this more later. Of a, <laughs> it's more of a, <laughs> on the side of, uh, it's not necessarily about the client. It's about us showing the uh, tax authorities that we are paying the tax. That we are. Oh, like they don't trust you? So or, they, or the vendor. They don't trust you? So it's like down to the, re like the amount of data that you're producing for this government is ma that's all right we're going to get back to that that's i had no idea right i'm hoping that i'm not you know i i'm not disclosing here um uh, <laughs> some <laughs> secrets but yeah no i don't, I don't <laughs> think you are if somebody came to me to solve this problem the idea of the receipt would not have been on my list of building teams around so but we're going to get back to it. we're going to get back to it that that's it's mind blowing to me i had no idea this stuff existed right Okay, what I like to ask all of our guests is to kind of go back into the time machine and think about some of your first memories um, working with a computer where you had these kind of aha moments or something funny or like, what, what, do, what are some of your first memories? Try to give us a general sense of how old you were and if you feel comfortable a date so we can get a sense of what computing was like back then. So first memories from a computer are definitely in the 80s. 
I think probably 1988. I was a big fan of Tetris. Big, big fan of Tetris. Oh, I remember the Tetris game. 88. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. That, that's it. I, I don't know. Probably spent hundreds of hours on this one, maybe more. So you had a computer at home. You were living in Israel at the time? Correct. I grew up in a tiny town, I think 1,000 families, very, very small place. My dad was working with computers at the time. We had a computer at home. Given that I know the format of your podcast, since I binged it today, by the way, <laughs> excellent, excellent podcast. I really, truly recommend it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the computer was in an office inside a house. Uh, and it was shared. It was uh, my parents and I have an older sister, so it was us. Um, so my mother used to use it for work. So she was a lawyer. And my dad used to play with me, basically. And I think, I think my sister was just around the time when she was uh, graduating from high school. So back then, nobody had a computer. Nobody actually turned in papers, let's say... Uh, that are printed. Everything was by hand, so I don't think she actually used it for school or something like that. That kind of happened later for me, uh, during the 90s. Yeah, I mean, I went to high school in, I graduated high school in 87, and I remember all through elementary, middle school, and high school being pounded on my penmanship, writing in script. Who writes in script anymore outside of their signature, right? And like, being pounded because that's how you had to turn work in, right? So uh, we don't have, <laughs> well, we do have script, but it's Hebrew script and it's not connected as you do. Um, I actually, to this day, don't really uh, read well uh, script in English. Neither do I, so don't feel bad. <laughs> so uh, if people send me letters and then I go to my boyfriend to, <laughs> to read them for me. Are you because, getting, you're I getting mean, letters where people are writing in script? Could be, you know, a Christmas card, stuff like that. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> how old are these people that are sending you? First of all, how old are these people that are sending you a Christmas card? And I have to imagine you're talking about people that are probably in their late, mid to late 60s, right? No. So this happens no? to me at work, you know, like uh, uh, people like a greeting card for my birthday that is being passed around and then people write cursive letters and then I, I struggle and it's also usually very tiny because, you know, uh, there's a card and 20, 40, whatever people want to write in it, on it. So. Wow. I don't use script. Only for my signature. Everything else is print, but you would never even consider writing something even if I'm filling out a form, I put it in some software and I type everything in, right? Like, that's amazing what you just brought up because she wasn't using the computer. Your sister wasn't using the computer for school. Your mom was a lawyer. What was she using it for? Because we weren't connected to the internet back then. So before you would use a typewriter to turn anything to the courts. Mm. So she was using it as a word processor. Well, yeah, literally, she, like that's, Pretty much the only thing that she would use it for was uh, a word processor. And then you were using it to play games with your dad, specifically Tetris. And then you must have became a Tetris master then. You're talking about hours here, right? Like how many levels? We do not understand. So there were, there were nine at the time. Nowadays, there's more. By the way, I'm, I'm, I really appreciate you entertaining this. <laughs> um, so I was, uh, I was a serious, serious player. I was an unbeatable. Uh, I could spend hours and hours and never, never, uh, you know, get disqualified, lose, whatever. Not once. Like. So if they had open champ world championships back in like 88. <laughs> so basically you would play for hours and you wouldn't get bored even though the system couldn't beat you. In a way, prepared me for what I do today, right? Mm, I see. I can spend hours and hours and hours on anything. and Interesting. Tune anything, everything out and just go. So when does your, I'm, I'm guessing you're like maybe in middle school at this time. So this would be called junior high, I think. Does that make sense? Well, I'm not allowed to use junior high because then I'm, I'm labeled very old. Oh. Because when I went to school, it was junior high. I say it to my kids and they start to beat me up. So I guess they brainwashed me not to say junior high. It's middle school now. It's not hip. Like, that's what no, me. Right? no, it's middle school now. <laughs> so just, just remember that. Unless you want to annoy somebody 
who's around that age. Then... You know, it helps. <laughs> I mean, but they are so easy to annoy anyways. Uh, I don't see the need. <laughs> okay, so when does your interest from playing turn into, I don't want maybe maybe programming or knowing more and learning more about how all this stuff works? Because I know you as a, a pretty hardcore software developer, and you've kind of starting out your life here playing Tetris. <laughs> like, is there, when, where does this transition begin to happen? Is it in high school? Is it with your dad? Is it, what happens? It really doesn't. I was not that kind of a kid, not at all. I played games. I think still to, until today, I feel like that's a valid way to spend one's time is gaming. In high school, I was going to the arts program in my school. I was also in science class and I was going to the arts program in my school. And that was really in high school. And I went to the arts program because I used to paint quite a lot and I really, really loved it. And then I went to the first class uh, of art. I, was, I wasn't impressed. I basically wanted to paint and they wanted to teach me about uh, color theory, which I will learn later in life is actually quite important. But um, I was not a very serious uh, person back then. And so then and the other option during that time was to go and learn computers or what we called computers, which was actually to program in Pascal. And that's what I did. That was actually the first time that I really wrote programs. For that, I kind of, you know, there were a basic class here and there in, you know, maybe middle school, maybe a little before, but there was nothing, you know, serious. And in high school, I was basically learning to program and I, st I stuck around and I learned Pascal and I graduated in Pascal. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I am. I, I am here. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Go for you, it. Yes. You, you, you enter high school with the idea that you're going to learn and master art. Yes. And painting. And your very first class comes in and they're trying to be technical about color. Correct. And you're like, I don't want to be technical about color. Absolutely. I just want to throw some color on a canvas. And then you look to your left and you say, look, I can also learn how to program because that's not technical. And you decide to start learning how to program in Pascal other than learning your, your color theory. Yeah. You didn't find the programming to be as technical and as tedious as learning color theory. I'm, like there was something that obviously attracted you to it. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's understand. So there's something to, to, to be said about the Israeli uh, uh, education system. And that is that if you know how to play the system, it's actually rewarding in grades. So I knew that it will be incredibly rewarding to my grade, actually much more rewarding to my grade to have a high score in computers than it is in arts to, you know, to, towards university. What I actually wanted to do with my life, by the way, back then, was a physicist. So your goal, wait, 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 wait. Your goal entering high school was to get to university to study physics. Yes. And so your plan was to get the best grades you could possible in high school, regardless of the subject, because that was going to get you into university where you wanted to be. Yes. And you thought art was going to start that. No, art. so I wanted to learn arts because I really loved arts. But if they're going to take the magic out of it, I might as well learn something that will get me somewhere, you know? <laughs> like, but later in life, like I want to say something to anyone who might be listening, who, uh, um, who understands the importance of aesthetics and stuff like color theory. I apologize dearly, I think we already covered that kids are annoying, and I was one of those kids. Like, there is no... I, I don't have any excuses, that's the story. <laughs> so. Okay, but, but even though you took this programming track in high school, I can't imagine you stopped painting at home. I mean, you had a love for it, right? So yeah. you were still painting on your, on your own terms. Do you still paint today on your own terms? or? Once in a while, yes. Once in a while, not as much as I used to. I think even back then, I was actually changing passions from painting to uh, diving. 
which is you know uh, one of my oldest 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 hobbies. That is one that I actually will do at any opportunity that I have, but living in Germany, I don't have that many anymore. But I'm not that religious about painting anymore. I wanted to ask you, were there other things you were doing in high school? So diving was one of them. Was there a diving team? No, diving is uh, scuba diving. Oh, scuba dive. I'm thinking you're jumping like yeah. 30 feet off no, of no. the platform. Scuba diving. I was running okay. in high school. High school and middle school. I was, uh, I was running. You were in track. What distances were you running? 1,500 and 2,000 meters. Yeah, so you were the long distance runner. I was doing that in track too. I used to get so depressed before the race because I'm like, man, I've got to run for the, like the next five minutes or for the next 10 minutes. But I was too small to be a sprinter, so I kind of had no choice. Did you ever feel like depressed that you had to run? Like you knew no matter what, this race was going to take you 10 minutes to finish, whether you liked it or not. Yeah, uh, I wasn't depressed about it, though. Um, the, uh, the thing was what I was I, depressed about, what I was really depressed about, I was mediocre. I was never going to be the best also. Like, that was not... That was just not happening, not with the physique that I had, whatever it was. But I had, you know, for what I didn't have, what I wasn't born with, I made up with you know, determination. Um, and uh, but yeah, but there is this, you know, kind of uh, that that feeling, like you know, at the beginning, where yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna win this, but you know, I was a team player. I, I would try to basically get uh, a good to a good place so that the average would, would get the team something. And that also never yeah. happened because we weren't that great a team either. <laughs> <laughs> Not in middle, no, but in middle fine. school we were amazing. In middle school, oh, in middle school we were really, really good. We were the best in the county, but not on the uh, country level at all. But in uh, high school, that was not, not, the, not at all the case anymore at all. <laughs> all right, so... so. You've got your art, you're doing that on your own terms in high school. You've got your track, you're scuba diving when you can, and you're taking more and more computer classes where you're learning how to code in Pascal with the goal of becoming a physicist. Yeah. You know, this is, uh, this is, where, this is where, because I listen to, uh, to your talk uh, to a lot of people now, and um, I am very concerned with how you summarize this because you make me sound like a much more serious kid than I was. <laughs> uh, I, was <laughs> I was somebody who, uh, do you want to try and qualify for track? Yeah, okay, I'll give it a go. And then, you know, eight people, uh, the first eight people were in and somehow I was eight. <laughs> or they took seven people and somehow I was seven. So this was how I qualified. Like it wasn't, you know, like the biggest passion or anything, but I sort of gave things a chance. Anything you wanted to do, you got in. I mean, who cares if you weren't picked first? You got in. You wanted to do something, you made it happen. <laughs> right? Like that's your entire life. You wanted to do something, you made it happen. Okay. Right? We're seeing it at an early I'm not going to, I'm not, yeah, okay. Let's, 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 let's roll and then we'll see. And let's then, go with no, that. Yeah, because, you know, as we are going to progress with the story, <laughs> we're going to uncover, we're going to, because you and I, we've known each other a long time and you don't know everything. No, I don't. And as we uncover more stories, <laughs> you're going to realize who is this person. I'm kind of worried about that, but let's, let's do it. Let's, uh, let's give it a go. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. We're like about 20 minutes in, so I want to get us to university here. But before you get to university, you have to do your, your service, right? Yes. Is that how that works? So you know that, what is that, two years of service? One year, nine months back then. Nowadays, it's two years. Yeah. I'm curious, were you happy, sad, excited, not excited that you had to, to do this? Did you see this as a waste of your time? Did you see this as it's something I have to, I have to do and it's good for me? And the, like, I'm, I'm always curious what your thoughts were going in and then what were your thoughts coming out of that? I was excited going in. Yeah, you know, uh, I never actually really came to terms with this because so uh, the person that I was back then, also the country that was back then, political climate was different. When I went into the army, there were peace talks. Uh, the whole country narrative was very different. And uh, I went in incredibly excited. And uh, yeah, actually during my service, that's, that's actually when peace talks uh, ceased. 
um, the second that your father happened. So it's something that, you know, like I, I feel like I lived in a movie in a way where, you know, there is a before and after for a person. So the person I was afterwards is quite different. So that, that service had a big impact in shaping your worldview or shaping what you were going to do after? It's interesting. It wasn't the service, so it wasn't the duration, but like the next 10 years, I sort of find myself reframing my service and reframing my service. Uh, at heart, I was a pacifist even in high school. Like, uh, I was just sort of convinced I wasn't. It's kind of clever how how we label pacifists, like depending on societies where we are. So in Israel, a pacifist is, you know, the way that you would uh, depict maybe Jesus. Somebody who would turn the other cheek, always, etc. And yeah, that was not me, but I didn't have, I didn't really have the terminology, you know, going into university to sort of to say or to explain who I am to myself and to others. And I did go to the army with the expectation to do good. My service was not, you know, a good dramatic service at all. And there was no, like, I didn't do any harm. But that kind of expectation to have what we call in Israel the meaningful service, where people want to have a meaningful service, want to have some impact, that is something that, you know, I went in, with with all the hope to, you know to to sort of achieve and the person that i am today is quite more cynical about it you know when you were in your service was was your service primarily being on guard and being on post or were you able to do things technology wise that you were you developing skills that you could use outside of of your service like when you got to university and beyond i uh, i was a combat instructor so I didn't do anything myself, let's say, and I was an instructor and uh, I didn't have any kind of training. We have an entire industry that is famous for it. I was not part of it at all. Yeah, we, we talked about it. It's like, I know how to fire a gun. Yeah. I find it interesting. You found yourself in a mentoring role at some point, even in service, like you were an instructor. I wasn't very good at it, though. Is that, is that, yeah, I became better at it, like, thank God, because at some point, like, I realized, like, I mean, if you think about it, if you really think about it, like, the person that I was back then was, I call it half-baked. Like, I wasn't sure who I was. I didn't know where I wanted to be. I, I didn't know even the kind of people that I want to surround myself with. Like, there's a bunch of, you know, there's a massive journey that I'm going to have to get through. The truth is, military service is boring. You spend, I don't know, 50% of your time moving things around from one place to another. Like, there's a bunch of things that people don't understand. Like, the logistics, <laughs> soldiers do themselves. Like, <laughs> there is a lot, <laughs> uh, a lot of nonsense involved in uh, getting anything done. I was drawing on cardboards, you know. There's, there's a lot of things, like, people think, oh, okay, instructor, yeah. Oh, she knows how to fire a gun, cool. But, you know, I was growing on cardboards, like, a lot. And then there were a, pro a projector. Like, we got a projector, so now we had to uh, make slides. I, I made slides with my knowledge in color theory. <laughs> Which I still don't understand. <laughs> oh, I feel like you have, because you've mentioned this a few times already, it's like you feel like you had this expectation that you were supposed to know who you were already coming out of high school and doing service and you feel kind of like it's wrong that you didn't but I mean how many people really coming out of high school know who they are yet and know really where their passions are I, I, I don't I don't think many people do were you surrounded by people who knew exactly who they were and what they were going to do because that to me would be shocking and they knew who they wanted to be. I was surrounded, and I, uh, for a very long time, I was surrounded by people who not only knew who they wanted to be, they went through the crisis of, uh, this is not what I wanted earlier than everyone else. But um, I was really surrounded by people like that, and I felt incredibly inferior. I wanted to be more, I wanted to be less unique, let's face it. Like, I really wanted to be somebody who's a little bit more, uh, who doesn't stand out as much as I did. 
And I spent a lot of time, you know, doing what everybody else did, trying to... I think that's true. I think that's because... The, and the problem was that every time I was sort of hit with reality, and then I, I didn't know what to do with it. Because nobody else was experiencing this. Nobody around me was experiencing this. And uh, people's, people's reaction to it were, you know, mostly about, well, uh, if you did more things like everyone else, you wouldn't be in this position in the first place. <laughs> and like you're just you're just still too unique, right? Like I mean like I feel I felt like uh like there was something dramatically, I don't know, incorrect about the way that I saw things. Was it was I wrong? Was I right? Was it normal uh kid stuff? I don't know. I know that I was a little bit extraordinary where I was, and other people around me did not necessarily share the same, the same problems, the same concerns. At least your perception of everybody around you seems to have been everybody else had their, had their stuff together. They knew what they were doing, they knew where they were on it to go, and you didn't. I was so, yeah, you, you know, like, I think I think you could actually uh, relate to this. So I grew up in a, quite a conservative environment, and people knew that, you know, okay, I'm going to finish high school, I'm going to go to university. They had some idea of, maybe, maybe they didn't know what they wanted to do in life, but they had some idea, for instance, that, okay, so they knew that they were going to go to university. Parents already had, you know, had uh, put aside money to make that happen. They knew if they were going to live at home or, you know, or go to the dorms or live with flatmates. The point is like that, yeah, sure, maybe not all the details are, are, are sorted out, but they had some idea about the kind of future they wanted to have. I had friends who, wouldn't, who would happily make statements like, I'll be married by 25. And then later on, maybe, you know, that has changed. A lot of them, you know, have grown as people and have changed their minds, which people, are, you know, tend to do. But where I was, things were not so clear. So uh, when I'm going to go to university, people, you know, it's kind of normal in Israel that after military, you're going to have a nice long trip somewhere. I didn't know how I was going to afford one. It's, it's just that where I was was not where uh, friends, other people my age who I grew up with, my friends, even close friends were. It sounds like you felt, and I don't know if this was you putting pressure on yourself. But I, I, I keep hearing this theme that you keep feeling like you're supposed to have some clarity of thought on things because everybody else seems to have clarity of thought and you don't and you're starting to question yourself because you don't have it. Back then, yes, yes. Back then I was definitely, I mean, people didn't question the army. I questioned, you know, that every day. My friends did not. It was not. It was obvious. It's obvious to them, and it's obvious to them. Uh, people. It was even obvious to them that they wanted to become officer. I well, I didn't become officer. An officer. It wasn't obvious to me. So you get out of service and you decide to go to university. Are you still going to be in physics at this point, or has that idea changed for you? I get out of service, and there is. Uh, an insane, insane, uh, like, uh, economic depression. And the uh, dot-com bubble burst. We're talking about the end of, uh, the beginning of 2001. I get out of it, and I actually, I, I, uh, I go to work in uh, customer support. And uh, in a startup, back then called HumanClick, today known as Life Person, so they're actually still around. And the CEO gathers everyone and tells them that he does not think that the internet is going to be closed. He is pretty sure that we will have jobs. Like, that's where we are. And if I don't have that job, then maybe I will never have another job again. Like, that's the feeling. So wait, 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 wait. So you leave service, decide not to go to university. I didn't decide. I didn't have, I needed money. So I needed to go into... Okay. All right. So you didn't have money to go to university. So you decide you're going to take a job, and you take a job with this internet company, which is still around today. And you, what, what, what are you doing at this company? You're doing customer service? Support service, yeah. 
on the technical side? Technical, what is, like, um, please restart your browser. Yeah, very technical. <laughs> okay, but you're talking to, you're 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 talking to people who are maybe not as technical as you are, like my mother or something is having a problem with a computer. Is that is that what this is or? agents so it's a live chat for uh people who have um you know websites and uh, they want to incorporate a chat into it so that they can chat with people who are visiting their sites and that's what we did and uh, the support was the same exact live chat so i was basically uh, also helping people decide on uh, which package they were going to buy from us etc okay okay and how long were you at that company? I think a year, something like that. I can't imagine you were happy in this job. This this seems like you would have been bored after three months or something. I was loving it. We were playing computer games all, all day. <laughs> you were practicing your Tetris we're for still, another year. We're still at the gaming. <laughs> nights, I see. like nights, nights and nights and nights. You know, yeah. So you're sitting in like a call center playing video games and chatting with people, you're multitasking to keep your brain. Uh, so what happens after a year? Do you, what is it, why did you leave? What, what decided, now I guess we're talking about 2002, 2003 or something. Uh, we're talking about 2002. I moved to a, a city, <laughs> to this city. It's not this city, it's not Tel Aviv, it's in the outskirts, of, it's another city next to Tel Aviv. Why are you moving? You just want to get away? Like, yeah, so I decided to go on my independent uh, way. And you find a job in this city? I start waiting tables. Okay. If you make the same money. <laughs> if you're asking yourself, I mean, post.com bubble burst, it was not a good economy in, uh, even for developers back then. So imagine for the, uh, the support people. Well, I'm, I, I wasn't thinking of that in terms of the money. I was thinking more in terms of were there no tech jobs where you could have continued doing tech or did you feel like this was just what you needed to do at the time but you see this is this is this is uh, this is what's interesting i was not a technical person i was not to anyone people i grew up with would be blown away by what i did i was supposed to be a journalist i was supposed to be i don't know a an artist a lawyer i was supposed to be a bunch of different things you know, I have some rhetorics, you know, to, uh, to support my ability to maybe become a uh, lawyer. Um, I have, I paint, <laughs> I write poems, I do a lot of things that, you know, technical people don't do that. So, yeah, uh, besides the gaming, I think I was not perceived, and even the gaming, I was not perceived at all as, as that kind of a person who would take these kinds of uh, roles. Tell me this, tell me this. How do we get from 2002 Rona to Rona who eventually becomes a software developer? Like fill in the gap about what happens in your life, what changes in your life, who you met, what opportunities came in. How do, how do we get from non-technical Rona to technical Rona and like kind of maybe what year does that all start to happen? 2003 I decided to uh, have some money I back then I found so after waiting table turns out I'm a horrible waitress. Horrible. <laughs> Why are you horrible? Like every time you deliver the food, it's cold. It's like so. It's so the, the thing was like you know like no like but I have to say like this is this was important to me. This was really important to me to be good at it, and I really tried. <laughs> and I want everybody to understand that I wish I really wanted to be one of those people who. Uh, go to university and with tables on the side. Like, I really thought that, that, like, that was the dream. Is there something romantic about that? Like... Whatever it was, like, it didn't happen, <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there was some, like, yeah, romantic notions. I mean, I, like, I think you're starting to get the idea of, you know, how, how I felt, how I viewed reality. Like, I had fantasies. I didn't have clear ideas about what I wanted. I had fantasies. So I fantasized about being that person. Uh, did not work out. And, uh, but turns out I am a very good secretary. So I, <laughs> I found a job as a secretary and I was, uh, I was incredible at it. And I made enough money so that I could actually go or think about going to university. 
and I switched in a matter of months, like I kind of started having friends who were studying uh, physics already because uh, maybe they didn't have you know work or before going to university, so they went before me. I got a, got a little more sense about what, what it is, what, what, what the field actually was, and I realized that who I wanted to be was a mathematician. And then I signed up for university. One second. How long are you working this, sec this secretary job before you can get to university? I have to imagine it's going to take you a year or two of saving money. Well, I mean, I worked up until university, like, you know, I signed up before, but yeah, a year and a half, maybe more. Okay, so 2003, 2004. 2003, at the end of 2003, I'm already in university, like I'm already in Rome. So now you decide that you're going to be a mathematician. The, the math is what's important now. Correct. And I want to not just have a degree in mathematics, if we're talking long term, like I want to, I want to go the whole, all the way. I sign up for math and I have to make references and sign up first for math. And then second, I put computer science, although as far as I'm concerned, the last time that I wrote code was at the age of 18, just before, just as I was finishing uh, high school, that is it. Um, I will never code again. Like I am, I know that that's, that's, but I need to, I need to have three and I only have two, like math and physics. And I don't really want physics. So I put second, uh, computer science, and then third, I put physics. And I know that I'm not going to get into computer science because it takes insane grades. And then I get into math and computer science degree combined. No idea how. Now it's a different story. Are you shocked? Are you happy? Are you like, they tell you you're going to do both math and computer science? I don't, I don't remember. I think, no, I think back then you would get things they post. No, I saw this online first before I got the, before I got the, but I, I remember that I was sitting in front of the computer like this, like, you know, <laughs> mouth open, <laughs> the whole like, thing. Oh my God. Like, what just happened? And now I have a decision to make. And now it's not, it's not easy because, I mean, people don't just get into computer science and just, you know. So you got to choose one or the other. No, I, I, it's a combination. Like I can, I can complete now a degree in both. But technically, like it's a, uh, it's a double major. You know, people don't pass up like an opportunity like that. And I'm having a crisis, like an actual crisis. So it's not who I see myself. But you put that on your paper. I don't understand. You put on the paper math, computer science. Yeah, but I was expecting to get my first. I mean, my first. So the thing is, like, you're supposed to choose. And I didn't really have three choices. I wrote something now. Like, I mean, you can, you can write, like, I could have written medicine. <laughs> I mean, stuff could have, no, not medicine, because there is an actual committee that you have to get through. But you get what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Like, yeah. It's not, I just, I, I wanted to, like, my first choice was math. I, I wasn't really even thinking in that direction. It, there was no hope involved. There was nothing. It was just. So the crisis is, what is, what is your crisis that you now feel compelled that you have to do the computer science because they accepted you? Yeah. That you can't say no to it? Yeah, I felt like it, yeah. So you decide to do the double major? I had to go for it, yeah. I decided to do it. And four years later? And I never finished school because I ran out of money. Oh my goodness. But, but I found out, so two things that I found out during my... I told you this was not going to be... A, this is not your like typical inspirational you know, story. This is somebody no, who this was is a like, real life. basically throwing into situations <laughs> and <laughs> figuring out who they are as they went. This is not a, um, I, I don't have one of those stories. Um, this is real life, so, right? You're, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you know, look, look you, you have some kind of roadmap. You have some sort of goals. You have some sort of dreams, but you still have to navigate life each and every day and and there's roadblocks, and you're walking around them. So now you run out of money to go to university. I don't. Did you did you get a year of university in? Two years in before. So uh, two years, yeah. Like I mean, technically, I I did the whole three years, but on the on the third year, like so, second and third year, I was working just way too much. 
This was while you were still doing university or after? So what happened was that I started taking a job on the side to support myself, to continue supporting myself. Turns out that I can't really be a waitress in the evenings because I'm really bad at it. So I actually have to get a day job and I actually managed to get one, which is insanely impossible. I am a developer and nobody is a developer now. We're talking in a time when, you know, all the companies uh, have uh, gone bankrupt. Everything is closed. People with, uh, with masters don't get jobs. And I managed to score one. You don't let that one go. So I held on to it, you know, like uh, crazy. You find this job where you get to do some programming, like 2005 or something. While I'm in university, yeah, not some. I'm a developer. Like, I am the, the, the thing, like, you know, like I... And the issue is that to me, I am still going to be, by the way, like a mathematician. This is not, we're, we're still not at the point where I was even willing to let this go. It's something that I really wanted to do. So I was uh, kind of living a double life, sort of, like my day job does not. And I, I happen to like it, be decent at it, make a name for myself doing it. What, what type of software are you developing? I'm working on a web service in C++, essentially. Wow, was there, there must have been another, other developers there too, right? So you're learning. Learning like crazy. And that basically means you can't really be doing a university because you're doing this full time during the day. When are you taking classes? So I take them here and there. I make up what I can. I do, uh, I wake up every day at five in the morning. It's actually the best time of my day, I think, was between five and eight a.m. When, when I was actually doing homework and stuff like that. And uh, also I was living back then, I was living in Jerusalem. It's so pretty in the morning. It's just gorgeous in the morning. I would be sitting on, on my porch, sometimes freezing to death and couldn't kill us. And it was just gorgeous, gorgeous city. So how long how long are you at this job coding in C and C++ on? Three years. Three years. What makes you decide to leave this job? It sounds like you're doing some fun technical stuff here. Actually, were you enjoying the work? Were you enjoying coding and C and C++ at the time? I love the language. I love C++. It's my first love. So this is, I think, when I finally learned to uh, put what other people think uh, my life should be in perspective and realize that I still I need to start making my own choices. For instance, back then, nobody I know wants to do web services and databases. Everybody wants to do cool stuff. What's cool stuff? Uh, let's say real-time embedded. That's the cool stuff. That's what, you know, people want to do, or maybe trading algorithms, stuff like that. Those are uh, the cool jobs out there that my friends are searching for themselves. And I'm having a blast. I'm building things, you know, that things that I didn't know that I could. I am experimenting how a server, a web server actually has to behave, how to handle timeouts. I find a major, major problem with how, with how we man, uh, manage our, our timeouts. I fix it. I make a name for myself. I am learning things about databases that you know I find incredibly fascinating uh, people take for granted <laughs> like transactions how they work like I am super stoked about all of those things and it's not considered you know it's not considered awesome but until I think cloud computing gets involved in a game and suddenly, I don't know there is a MySpace is making you know uh, is making web services look awesome and people start understanding ah handling a lot of traffic is pretty cool there is something there there's a problem you know worthy of our consideration and i've been doing that for a while so i'm really i'm starting to be really happy with what what my career has become and i drop i think finally the math idea behind <laughs> and i start like uh, focusing on what i have and sure in a parallel universe, there is a Rona. I think I told you this before. We're sitting in a lab somewhere with no friends, working on whatever paper she's working on right now. And remembering a time when she maybe had friends and uh, wondering why things did not work out <laughs> so well for her there. But I get to be this one. <laughs> 
Well, I, I think this this but this is a better universe you're in right now. I, I kind of like where things happen. It's just that everything is just so dramatically, you know, from an administrative error that led me to this point, yeah. I guess around 2008 then you decide to leave this job. Like, what's your next, what's your next move? You seem so happy here. In 2006, actually, I decide, I, I think I go, I go to Samsung. I want to do, I want to try the real-time embedded thing. <laughs> so I actually am hired to do a project there, a very specific thing, like something very, very specific for the infrastructure team for three months. So I get to basically try it out. Like I think actually getting a job, like getting hired to do this without any experiment, any experience in it was, uh, was impossible. But this was, so, so I get this job. And I realized that it's not that interesting. Like, uh, and, uh, I, but I am looking for not embedded for other things. And I go to something like uh, the uh, cybersecurity space. Uh, for three years. Let me ask you a question. You, you have this great job. It's full time. There's security. You're enjoying it. And you decide to take a risk on a three month contract to see if you like embedded programming with Samsung. Were you not worried about what was going to happen in three months if you didn't like it or they didn't hire you? That, that wasn't even on the radar screen? What was was that I wanted to uh, actually uh, turn my CV with Embedded to another company with Embedded experience and say, hire me to do Embedded. Oh. Cause, like, I needed the experience to get in. So this was like my way to get that experience. You can think about it like an internship, but for people who have already had a few years in, uh, in the industry. But I like the confidence. I mean, you were very confident that after you did these three months, your CV was going to be, and you were going to be strong enough to get this next job, right? You didn't have a worry about getting another job. Financially, I, I could have been secure for a few, for uh, for a little bit longer, but I was I was pretty confident that I can uh, get into jobs. I had uh, already, so C++ was very lucrative. It was kind of uh, oh well, if you have experience with C++, you can write anything. In a way, I think it's the perception till this to this day. I saw this as a, as a good opportunity. Like, uh, I didn't see this as a risk at all. Why? I don't know necessarily. Don't remember why. Probably, I, I, I probably had a, a re reasons to be so, so sure. But I was also like, when I was interviewing for work, I would, I would interview to 40 places. Like I didn't have problem you know, going everywhere and sit down for interviews like this would this used to be like something that I would take seriously as work. I would get really good at it before I would expect, uh, you know, to uh, to sign a contract and then I would negotiate a good contract. Like I was really, really serious about getting work. It sounds like you're also really good at hearing the word no, because you said you like apply to 40 jobs and you know the majority of them are going to say no. A lot of people have a problem with that kind of hearing rejection over and over again. It can be depressing. You're like, no, I know you're going to say no. I'm perfecting this and eventually somebody's going to say yes. Yeah, well, it's, I think, um, I think it's always been my mindset. I remember, you know, that this is, this goes back like to high school. I remember that there was a test where I got zero and a lot of people dropped physics because they got 70. And I learned two things. One is that if you don't study, you might get a zero. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of expected a 20 at least. <laughs> but <laughs> I was, you know. <laughs> well, what, was the, what was the second thing? <laughs> but what, was, what, but was what the I learned from my friends was that you could study and you're still going to get a low grade if you don't know what to study. And that has always been my mindset, like, tell me what I need to study. So if you're going to go to job interviews in this industry, you're going to find that uh, tests vary, interviews vary, questions vary, and they also change over time. And if you want to get good, you need to know what to get good at. And that is sort of the basis, I guess, for that. This is something that really, like, I, I've always taken with me. Wow. That's, that's a really interesting perspective because I'm meeting more and more people that are like, I don't want to start interviewing right now. I'm not prepared. I'm not ready. And what you're saying is, 
Well, you're not going to be prepared and ready until you actually start interviewing and start seeing the questions and start. So is your advice then not to start with the actu with companies you really want to work at? Start at ones that are not necessarily top of your list? I will tell you, I will tell you something. Like, kind of yes and also, but add another aspect to it. Let them convince you why that you should. You know, don't go to places that you really would never ever in your dreams like set foot in. Like that does not make sense. That's also a waste of your time because they're likely not going to test you on the things that you want to. They're not going to have similar necessarily uh, processes to the ones that you're going to go through at the end. Let them convince you. So, you know, it kind of like also turns the table over. So now, uh, okay, now you're, you apply to a place. You didn't necessarily uh, want to work there, but maybe you did get in. What would it take? Like, is it certain contracts, certain things that you will get to do, certain positions, like? Have you been in that situation where you did the interview, it wasn't a company you were really expecting to get in, you're practicing, and they say, here, I only want to give you a job. And now, what are you doing? Actually, it has never happened to me. Because as I said, like I'm one, I'm somebody who got zero on the physics test and actually decided not to drop it. So you can assume that, you know, like I, I, I do a lot of stupid things that, like in interviews that I actually want. Like things can happen, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I know how to uh, fail spectacularly also in things that I really, really want. But it did happen to a good friend of mine who went to a, uh, to a job interview, a company he didn't want to work for. And then, you know, when they asked him how much he wanted, he gave them an impossible figure and then they said, yeah, okay. And then he had to really seriously think about this. And then he said yes. And then I think he spent two years there um, and he really loved it. And the only reason I think that he quit was because he decided to go to music school because midlife crisis hit him, I think, at the age of 28 or something like that. But, um, <laughs> but <laughs> that's super interesting because my question would have been, how long did he stay? Yeah, but the only reason that he left was because, you know, his real passion is elsewhere. Bill, okay, look, we've got eight minutes left. <laughs> how do we get from cybersecurity now to where you are today? What's how do we sum up in eight minutes some of the stories that we have here? How many jobs do you have between now and that cybersecurity job? Were you bouncing a lot between different tech, trying to find the tech you want to love? or No, I kind of knew. So I went back to web services at 2011. Uh, I took a, a job doing Ruby, actually. Wait, wait. You just went from C, C++ to Ruby? Yeah. Did you know Ruby at the time? Absolutely not. Right. What, what were your thoughts on not coding in C and C++ at that point? C and C++ became like a thing of the past back then. You know, people were doing a lot of computing. They were not doing, they were, were using Python and Ruby and JavaScript. They were not, my, JavaScript was still, there was no Node, I think, yet. So people were using uh, Python and Ruby. Yeah, there was Node, it wasn't popular yet. And it became clear that you don't have to work that hard to have applications up and running and I, I moved to Ruby not because I necessarily loved the language or anything because it was something new to do I was I have done this for a long time and now I wanted to do something new and wanted to try something new and I did so did did you enjoy coding in Ruby did you feel more productive did you so you you enjoyed the language you felt what, what, what was it that you enjoyed it has a beautiful syntax and I didn't have memory leaks, basically. <laughs> didn't have to go through all those, you know, crazy hoops to, uh, to write code and it would just work. I was able to focus on... Solving the business problem and not... De delivering and delivering and delivering for the very first time. It was dramatically different. It was fun. Uh, I really enjoyed Rails. Like, you know, before I started understanding that it doesn't make sense that Action Mailer will load every time <laughs> that you uh, run bundle. And uh, because how many apps actually send out an email? Like before these things became incredibly strange, uh, it, they made a lot of sense. And then, so I did, I did Ruby for a while. I'm going to be like, I'm going to, you know, give the tour. So I did Ruby for a while and I actually really did like it. 
And then uh, in 2014, I decide to move to Berlin. And I go to a company that apparently has previously been writing services in PHP, and they ask me if I'll be open to new uh, languages, new technologies, new frameworks, whatever. And they ask me if I'd be interested, if I'm okay with learning Go, and I say yes, and Scala, and I don't know, don't remember what else I told them, Erlang. Those were like, that was the holy trinity of languages that I wanted to learn back then. And I said, yeah, fine, you're hired. Then I go there, I build a new service. And my manager tells me that I want to uh, use Ruby for the front end. When I say front end, I mean like API. Uh, I want to use Erlang for the back end. And I go to my boss and then my boss tells me, nope, you are going to uh, use Go. When I said that you can use anything you wanted, I meant you could use Go. <laughs> and, and I understand. <laughs> and the thing is that people sort of like have tried for days to hint at me that he's not going to like that. And I'm like, but he told me that I can do whatever. Like, Trust me, it'd be fine. And then I go there, <laughs> explain the design and everything behind it. No, uh, that was not uh, his intention at all. So as you can see, also the Go thing is kind of an accident, but here I am. Were you upset now that you had to use Go or you were like okay with it and was something to learn? I, I started learning it and I decided it was a horrible language. It was not <laughs> love at first sight. I think it was the first, it was the first language that I didn't love. Was it because of some C and C++ baggage that you thought was? Yeah. What do you mean there's no generics? What do you mean there's no virtual table? What, what's going on here? Like, why? What do you mean you don't need it? <laughs> here I am telling you I need it. <laughs> I just did. I need it. It's done. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to explain myself to anyone. Um, and uh, I felt like uh, I had to be so, like, there was a lot of, uh, I had to be very apologetic. Like, no, you don't understand. This is the problem. Like, you know, like, I would have to take people through a journey just to explain why after 11 years in the industry or something like that when i say i need something i actually do need it i'm not making it up <laughs> like <laughs> because that was the feeling that people were not taking my word for it that being said uh, the first app that i wrote uh, had insane performance and that was without knowing go so without really knowing what i what i what i was doing i did incredible job <laughs> uh, and yeah you can't you can't argue with that. So, so I, I knew that there was something there, but it didn't mean that I have to love it, you know. <laughs> but I knew that there was something there. So, <laughs> so I was grumpy for, for a couple of years, but, uh, but I knew, but yeah, th there was something, you know, about it. How did you get into the women who go at this point, like wh how, and become mentoring in Go and teaching Go and talk, talk about some of that stuff too. 2016, I decided Berlin is not for me and I moved to the Netherlands. And uh, after a few months there, I realized that the Netherlands isn't for me. <laughs> and I decided to move back to Berlin. <laughs> but <laughs> I, think, I think a lot of immigrants know this one. Like, but when, when you find a home, like, uh, you know, don't, don't uh, think that it's uh, luck. Like there, there is something involved that. But I think a lot of uh, immigrants know that feeling that I, I was just describing. So it wasn't for me. And I wanted to go back and uh, incidentally, uh, the organizer of, and the founder of Women Who Go Berlin Chapter reached out to me uh, and asked me to help. I told her that I wasn't, I wasn't even in Berlin, but I am coming back. And she wanted me to, to help out and come and mentor in the meetups. She said, yeah, sure, when I come back. And then when I came back, she said, well, actually, I need you to take over the chapter <laughs> because I am moving to San Francisco. I'm talking, of course, about Vanessa Ortiz. And yeah, and I took over Women Who Go Berlin. I was just basically handed, a, <laughs> handed out like a, a, a Women Who Go chapter. Yeah, and I was actually very excited about that because around that time, I also decided to go into mentoring. When I was looking for work in Berlin, I was looking for work that will allow me to spend 20% of my time to dedicate to women in tech, whatever that you know, might hold. 
And that also worked pretty well with uh, Vanessa's plan to, uh, to give me the chapter. So this is how I launched basically my uh, mentoring program with the idea that I have been in this industry, you know, for quite a few years now. And I don't see the uh, numbers improving or at least improving dramatically. I am kind of tired of being the only woman in the, w in the room, definitely with, you know, my kind of seniority, etc., and my kind of background. And, and it's not just even, it's not even just the women, it's pretty much any kind of minority. I wanted to do something about it. I wanted to, I wanted to actually actively make a decision that around me, things are going to move uh, in, in a direction that, you know, that, that I want to see. I, I felt like I, I just, like I've been sort of going with the flow with it like all the time and now is the time to sort of start making decisions. And I made decisions for myself that are very ambitious about the numbers of people that I was going to impact and how, uh, et cetera. Like I was, I was very serious about it. Uh, it was a mission for me to really try and help. I figured that if I help 10 people this year, then, and they help, I don't know, five people the next year, then, you know, the amount of people is, is the, the ripple effect is just going to, uh, to be uh, enough to maybe start something. And you have helped more than a handful of women in Berlin get jobs programming, right? I mean, I, I've met some of them. Yeah, about, so the numbers are actually quite drastic, like, so in Go, not, uh, in Go is a handful or maybe a little bit more, but in general, uh, about 100. And uh, a lot of them are mentoring, which I'm very incredibly proud of them for doing that. I didn't understand how many people out there were just sort of looking for somebody to basically just, you know, help them be very, very pragmatic about the choices that they make and uh, help them move forward. I love that. hundred you've, you've helped a hundred people find work in tech that without you being there wouldn't have happened. Like that's incredibly amazing, right? Like, and the time and the dedication you put into that. Well, we don't know. We don't know that it wouldn't have happened. I, what, I, what I actually learned was that there is a lot of talent, insane amount and uh, really insane. <laughs> So many people that have uh, that I have helped are far more talented than I ever was, and uh, far more driven, and maybe you know less uh, lucky than I am uh, in terms of like, uh, oh, you have this opportunity uh, that you didn't even want, and now you're just getting it, you know, uh, which sort of defined my career. They don't, and I kind of love I love that I love that their story is going to be way more inspirational than mine. I really do. I love that that they when they influence people around them, when they talk, when they explain things, the way that they understand things is so different than the way that I understood things when I was, you know, at, at where they are in their careers. When like the whole thing is much more holistic, like about like they they will negotiate with their workplaces like diversity. They talk openly about things that I would never dream of doing, you know, uh, back in the day. And they demand, you know, to be uh, taken very seriously, which I didn't do. And I wish I did. I, I wish I uh, took more control over my life and didn't just let uh, my life take, uh, take it where it did. And I'm glad, I'm really glad, I'm really fortunate to, to have been a part, of it, uh, a part of this. I think it was the first time in, in like, that I actually was invested completely 100% invested in, uh, well, even in my career choices. Uh, they definitely influenced me and in how I understood opportunity and how I even reinterpreted my story, like, and how, you know, I got to where I am. It's amazing. So, yeah, I just, I want to get this, you know, I want this, get this message across, if you will. The amount of talent out there is insane and the reason that women sort of leave tech is usually because they have better opportunities 
because they don't have uh, a lot of growth. So we don't offer them uh, enough growth and we're definitely, we come with, with, a lot of, with a lot of disadvantages when it comes to work-life balance, etc. But most of the time, we really just don't offer enough. And the women that we attract are incredibly, incredibly talented and they can do well everywhere. And they do. They do insanely well. And what happens is that at some point, they're going to get offer to leave tech or to leave, not, not necessarily even leave tech, but even inside tech, but basically leave uh, the world of engineering and they will just take it because they're not stupid. And, uh, and that, is the smart, that is the smart choice to make. And this is something that I really, I really started seeing because when I realized the amount of talent that is sort of uh, going like, uh, through my hands, I realized that what's going to, the, statistically, the reasons that these people are going, to, are going to leave is because they're going to have a better choice. So we need to earn them. And it's sort of like what I'm, what I'm trying to do now is just be somebody that earns, uh, earns the, uh, uh, the talent of people around them. Yes. Yep. Okay. I, I can hear that. So let me kind of sum up the last couple or the last two minutes we have. Let me sum up a little bit. It seems to me like that moment when you put computer science down, it's a possible choice for university really ended up being the, uh, a piv pivotal decision in your life that kind of led you down this path of programming. I think you've always had mentoring and leadership in, in your life, even though I don't know if you've seen it. And now you're getting to apply everything you love to teaching and, and, and training women there in Berlin and now learning how to keep them in engineering. I, I, I think that's amazing. Am I, what do you think about that? Would you believe me that I don't remember doing it? <laughs> uh, no, but I think you've suppressed uh, it. No, no. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> because like at first I didn't understand how it happened. And then I kind of had that memory that I was thinking for an hour, like what to put in number two and number three. And that's probably the order that I put it in. Right. It's those silly little moments that when you look back 10, 5, 10, 15 years later, you realize, oh, my God, that there it is. Right. That was it. It's uh, actually it's uh, it's more than that. But um, yeah. All right. So, Rona, um, do, do me a favor. If anybody wants to reach out to you after listening to this and talk to you more about where they are in their lives, if they have similar paths or if they're interested in mentoring uh, go all that good stuff. How can they? What's the best way for anybody to re reach you? Well, if they want to be mentored, they can reach out to me on Twitter at Rona X, Rona with double N. If they want to mentor, especially in Go, they can go to GoBridge.org and find your mentorship program, Bill, and sign up there. Also, to be a mentee in Go, you can also sign up through there, right? It's the same place. It's all in the same place. Yeah, right? actually, we're going to be putting a new platform in place, I'm hoping next month, using Exorcism IO. So very soon we'll be announcing Exorcism IO as the platform for mentoring uh, through GoBridge and the GDN. So that's coming really soon. So that's a good point. All right, brilliant. So thank you for, for spending this hour with us talking today. I almost feel like we're going to have to bring you back at some point to go a little bit more detail from, from uh, the time you started C++. We kind of ran out of time. Well, maybe we'll do that at some point. So thank you for, for spending an hour talking to us today. Thank you. This is Bill Kennedy with the Arden Labs podcast. Thank you for spending time listening to Rona and I today, and hopefully we'll see you again real soon. <laughs>